time you want to start, it's fine. Yeah, we're, we're, we're right at 11, so. Good morning. Feel free to stay seated, but you can please join us in singing uh, Emma's Revolution. Peace, Salam, Shalom, and those are the words, so just climb right on. Thank you, Planted by Hands, for getting us off to a great start this morning. Did you guys mess up or something? Oh, I see. I, I couldn't see. Yeah. It was too late. So you sang in your mask? See, I couldn't sing it. Well, it sounded well. You, you could consider that as a technique. Well, <laughs> welcome, welcome to one and all to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Spokane, where our mission is to join together to create a nourishing liberal religious home and to champion justice, diversity, and environmental stewardship in our wider world. Or as we say in short here, to create community, find meaning, and work for justice. Great to have all of you here this morning. Uh, those of you who are with us in person, as well as those of you who are uh, streaming with us this morning, it's great to have everyone present. And I want to begin, as always, by embracing all that you bring with you, all of your uniqueness, your unique beliefs, your background, your lifestyle, your experiences, all that helps make you who you are is welcome here this morning. So great to have one and all. I don't have any... Uh, Special announcements outside I wanted to let you know thanks to Tom who reminded me earlier that the uh, problem solvers is which is a group of folks who get together and and uh, and solve problems <laughs> or at least talk about solving problems you know how that goes <laughs> yeah that's right but anyway it's going to be uh, it's a 10 a 10 a.m. on Mondays and they've been meeting over zoom for the past uh, you know many months uh, but they're going to have their first in-person sort of hybrid uh, meeting tomorrow. Uh, so those who would want to come to the church and, and be part of the problem solvers at 10 a.m. Could, could do so. <laughs> so. So other than that, I'm going to give you a few uh, extra minutes to uh, greet one another this morning. It, you know, we, we are kind of in a strange period as far as, uh, you know, what are we supposed to be doing as far as social interactions and, and uh, distancing and that sort of thing. So uh, right now our, our, our policy here at the church is to kind of, you know, you're all adults, we're going to let you decide. And then if, uh, you know, the state or the Fed should say we, we're recommending something stronger, hopefully we won't get to that point. 
then we would we would talk about imposing those policies. But for now, I'm going to leave it up to you to use your best judgment. Uh, so just kind of watch the body language of one another. So if there's folks that are ready to shake hands or hug or or uh, elbow bump or you know if you if they do this, you know, <laughs> back demon. Uh, just disrespect <laughs> wherever one another is at. So I'll let you figure that out. So please take a few moments to greet one another. Wonderful, and there's always more time to visit with one another during our social hour following the service, so I invite you all to stay around for that. We are going to move forward now by lighting our chalice, the symbol of our faith, the symbol of our unity and our solidarity, of our openness and our inclusion, of our community and our individual uniqueness. May this small flame be our offering of warmth to those who are cold and alone and a light to those in darkness. May it be a flame that ignites justice in our world and a beacon of hope to those in need. And may it reflect at least a spark of truth wherever truth has been lost and cast a healthy shadow of doubt wherever it's been found. Come, let us worship together. Let us open our minds to the challenge of reason, open our hearts to the healing of love, open our lives to the calling of conscience, open our souls to the comfort of joy. Come, let us worship together. Please rise as you're willing and able and sing with us hymn number 1010 in the blue hymnal or the words are on the screen there for you. We give thanks and we'll do this through three times. Oh jeez, and here I stand again. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, we give thanks.
Thank you so much. It is now time for our story for all ages. And if you would like to come, oh, looky there, we've got some folks who are going to come up and see just a little bit closer. Good. Thank you. Let's see who, I, who, who has come to help me out today, okay? Who do you think it is? Any ideas? I don't know either. I don't know either. I never know. I, go, I have a magic vortex under the pulpit. I reach in, and it just happens. Oh, look who it is. Mickey, yes, one of my favorite, favorite guests to have, Mickey Mouse. So, howdy, boys and girls. Good to see you. Well, that's very nice of you. So what brings you to Spokane today, Mickey? I'm here to make a very important announcement. Wow, an important announcement. Well, well, what is it? I want everyone to know that I've decided to resign from Disney <laughs> and to start a new career. <laughs> well, that really is big news. Uh, you've been with Disney I, for quite some time. How, how did they take the news? I haven't told them yet. <laughs> oh, I see. Well, uh, why haven't you told them yet? I was hoping you'd do it thorny. <laughs> me? Why, why me? Because I've never quit a job to Thor, and you have lots of practice. <laughs> well, I don't know if I would put it that way. How many jobs have you had? Let's see, how many jobs? I've, when I first, my first job, I was nine years old, I swept the front of the 7-Eleven in my neighborhood. And in high school, I worked for a deli, and then I became the janitor at the Westboro Professional Center. And in college, I worked, worked in HVAC and plumbing for the university. And then I became a member of the grounds crew at the seminary and had fun operating their, their, their heavy equipment. That's it. That's just about it. You know, outside of the 10 years I worked in TV news and six years in corporate video production and 23 years in ministry. <laughs> And were you fired from all of those jobs? <laughs> no, I was only fired from one, which I think is pretty good. Then you know what? You know how to quit a lot better than I do. I've had the same job my whole life. Well, that's why I can't imagine you doing anything else but being at Disney. What would Disney be without Mickey Mouse? You can ask them when you tell them I'm quitting. <laughs> Well, just, just what is it you're quitting to do, Mickey? I'm going to become a computer scientist. A computer scientist? I don't think I've ever even seen you use a computer. Never touched one. <laughs> well, then why do you want to become a, a computer scientist? It's my duty. Your duty? Yes, my friend Goofy said computer science is where I need it most. Why, why did Goofy say that? He read an article that says every computer needs a mouse. <laughs> well, Mickey, that doesn't, that doesn't mean a, a real mouse. A, a computer mouse is, is, is a handheld hardware device that controls a cursor to help users interface with text and icons files and folders on your computer. What did you say? <laughs> I said a computer mouse is a piece of plastic that you move with your hands. Oh. Oh. Yeah. So you know, Mickey, maybe you should learn just a little bit more about computers before deciding to quit your job. And you should probably stop taking career advice from Goofy. <laughs> well, how about Donald Duck? You know, I think that you're a pretty smart mouse, Mickey, and if you're willing to work hard and put your mind to it, you can do anything, even become a computer scientist if you still want to. But when it comes to your career, whatever you do, you're, you need to follow your own heart because work is a big part of our lives and it should be something that you enjoy doing. Jeez, if you put it that way, I'd rather work at Disney than anywhere else. Well, that's good to hear because I can't imagine Disney or the world being without its Mickey Mouse. And that means I can keep singing my favorite song. 
<laughs> oh no. And I see you really don't have to do that right right now. See you real soon. You know, maybe you should become a computer scientist after all. K E Y. I'd be happy to tell Disney you're quitting. <laughs> Why? Because I like you. Well, I like you too, and, and you always have to end on the same note, don't you? Sing it with me. N O U. Thank you, Mickey. greatly give and receive this morning's offering which sustains this community to its mission to the larger world. Please be generous. so much. We are now going to kindle our candles of care on behalf of those who are most on our hearts and minds this morning. I did not receive any specific requests, but let's move into a moment of silence on behalf of those you might be thinking of, and as always, you're welcome to name them aloud at this time, if you'd like.
those named aloud and those embraced in our silence and all those who are suffering in our world at this hour, we hold in our community with compassion. Please make yourself comfortable. The meditation this morning comes to us from Amanda Schuber, UU Religious Education Director in Chattanooga, Tennessee. In honor of the risk takers, those that hold the vision with clarity and charge forward with optimism even in the face of others' doubts, you are our lamplighters and our guides. May we never forget the courage it takes to lead the way forward. In honor of those cautious skeptics, those that gather the information needed to navigate the tumultuous waters of change, you are the map makers and the preparers of the stores. May we appreciate your attention to the details that keep us on course. In honor of the doubters, those that may fear the changing tides of a turbulent world, you are our anchors and remind us of where we have been and where we are as a community right now. May we relish your commitment to our history and your passion for those who we have become. In honor of the dreamers, those that imagine what we can be and do to and in this world, you are the winds that blow the sails of change, pushing us ever forward. May we revel always in your whimsy and hopes and that dares us to never stop becoming. May the work we do together strengthen our community and our world. May we heed the call to always hold the vision of the free church ever in our sight and to work towards justice. Together, we wield a powerful spirit that is strengthened by the gifts of all. My reading today is from the Book of Awesome Women uh, by Becca Anderson, and it, it is a book that has lots of brief bios on, on significant individuals. And of course, I didn't mark the page. Hang on just one second. I did mark the page, it was just the wrong page. I marked a page, not the page, I guess is how we would put that. So this is a reading will be just a little bit longer, uh, even more so now, than, uh, than usual. But I think it goes really well with the topic by introducing you to a, a significant figure that I'll be referencing a little bit in my sermon earlier uh, to a greater extent. Lord Byron remains a famed leader of the Romantic movement, with his brilliant rhapsodic poetry, prose, and flamingly vivid personality and excesses. What is far less well known is that his daughter was one of the great geniuses of all time, and is considered the world's first computer programmer. Augusta Ada Byron was born in 1815. Her father abandoned the family when she was one month old and she never knew him. She was educated by private tutors and her mother pushed her to focus on logic, math, and science, both because these were interests of her mother's and because her mother thought it might prevent Ada from manifesting the insanity she thought ran in Lord Byron's family. 
Ada was also forced to lie still for extended periods of time because her mother believed it would help her develop self-control. In 1833, at age 17, Ada met Charles Babbage, a mathematician, mechanical engineer, philosopher, and inventor who is credited with inventing the first mechanical computer. It was the beginning of a long friendship and working relationship. When she saw his prototype of the difference engine, as he called it, she was captivated and made a study of its blueprints as well as an industrial steam engine to understand its function. Two, later, two years later, she married the Earl of Lovelace and was then known as Ada King Noel, Countess of Lovelace. In 1841, she resumed her studies of mathematics and was given high-level research tasks by Professor Augustus de Morgan of the University of London. She also advanced her studies with the long-distance guidance of Mary Somerville. In 1842 through 43, she translated an article in French by Italian engineer Luigi Manabrea on Babbage's new analytical engine. Babbage read her translation and asked her why she had not written such an article herself since he considered her well able to do so and urged her to articulate her own ideas on the subject. She responded by adding an extensive notes section to the translated article, which were three times as long as the original article. <laughs> These notes included the first ever algorithm, a mathematical computer program. Also, within this text, she broke new ground with her insight that an analytical engine could go beyond mere mathematical calculation and serve other purposes. They were published in an English science article. Ada's authorship was identified only by her initials, AAL. In all likelihood, this was because women were not seen as credible scientists at the time. Unfortunately, after this brilliant conceptual work, she became increasingly unwell and died of cancer at age 36 in 1852. Ada's contributions to computer science were not acknowledged until the 1950s. Since then, she has received many posthumous honors for her work. In 1980, the U.S. Department of Defense named a newly developed computer language Ada after her. The intellectual, the moral, the religious seems to me all naturally bound up and interlinked together in one great harmonious whole. Ada Lovelace.
Kelly Lagruda, Peggy Eckloff, Daniel Gore, thank you so much. Saying thank you sounds like small compensation for such outstanding music, but that's all you're going to get. <laughs> So I, I, it, w it would be natural to think that computers are a, a relatively recent invention, but computers have actually been around for hundreds of years, and the computational thinking that makes them useful has been with us for thousands. As one MIT publication says, computers are agents that carry out the operations of computation, and computers can be humans, or machines. Not only can humans be computers by following math or logic to carry out certain procedures, but according to the same publication, computing is an ancient human practice, as evidenced, for example, by the Egyptian engineers who built pyramids around 2700 BCE who obviously knew a lot about geometry and were able to calculate the dimensions of angles and stones for each part of the pyramid and to leverage ropes, pulleys, and rollers to move stones into position. That took computational thinking. Egyptian engineers, however, are unlikely to have called themselves computers or thought of themselves that way, but the term was first coined in reference to humans, not machines. The electronic computer uh, the long electronic computer age really dates back only to the 1940s. But well before then, those who had jobs using math to make complex calculations were called computers. And they were by no means the first. The term computer, meaning one who computes, dates back to the early 1600s. When electronic computers finally came along, they had to be distinguished from the more well-known human computers and were initially called automatic computers. So as much as the computer age has only recently changed how we live our lives in major ways, the thinking behind it, which again is called computational thinking, is an ancient human way of thinking. It reflects our innate wish to accommodate routine tasks more efficiently, faster, and with fewer errors. That's something that humans want when we're involved in repetitive behavior. So our computers are really but an extension of our humanity, like most human tools. And humans, of course, are both male and female. Even the Bible reminds us that God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. As in Old English, the word man doesn't just refer to males, but to all humans, male and female. And as the genesis of the computer revelation, a revolution, I should say, uh, programmers were male and female too. Indeed, females were among the very first programmers and were some of the most accomplished early hackers. In those days, a hacker did not refer to someone who broke into computers, but to those who programmed them by hacking together pieces of code. Some of you may have watched the 2012 BBC series, uh, Bletchley Circle, about four women who were code breakers during World War II and afterward used their computational thinking powers to solve crimes. Yes. So, uh, although a, a fictional account, this, of course, series was based on historical fact. During World War II, for example, the military needed a way to accurately account for distance, elevation, and winds when firing weapons that could send projectiles for miles. So, according to MIT's book on computational thinking, the Army commissioned teams of human computers to work out firing tables for these guns. One of the most well-known of these teams comprised women working at the Aberdeen Proving Grounds 
around 1940. Their efforts were highly successful, which meant that they were also complex and very sophisticated computational thinkers. They organized into assembly lines, each one doing a different state of computation, until they compiled their firing tables. For tools, they used mechanical calculators to do basic arithmetic, adding, subtracting, division, multiplication. They followed programs, a, a set of procedures that managers established to divide the work and to govern which intermediate calculations move from one human computer to the next human computer. And as trained mathematicians, the human computers were able to spot the errors in their own computation and thus keep the firing type tables error free. So it's hard to imagine that humans can come up with calculations to figure out a way to fire a gun or a missile for miles and have it hit its target due to these without being interrupted by these various factors, right? Smart, smart people. You're probably also aware of the Academy Awards winning 2016 film Hidden Figures, I'm guessing, about three female mathematicians whose previously unknown efforts were extremely, extremely instrumental in the success of NASA's early space program. One of those hidden figures that this true story is based on, Dorothy Vaughn, was the acting supervisor of a group called the West Area Computers, referring to a group of African-American female mathematicians who worked at NASA from 1943 to 1958. And that group was just one subset of hundreds of female computers working for NASA during World War II. One of the reasons it was, or I should say since World War II began, uh, one of the reasons that it was mostly female, in fact, is because males were in short supply, uh, having been sent off to fight the war. You may also be familiar with the very first mechanical computer I mentioned a bit ago, design, designed in the 1830s by Charles Babbage. The non-electrical device that he called the analytical engine was based on a series of systems and gears and le levers uh, Babbage died before he could complete it, but he had intended its programming to come from punch cards that would instruct the machine to make various mathematical calculations. And those punch cards were designed with the help of the brilliant female mathemati mathematician I read about just a few moments ago, Ada Lovelace. So the very first computer programming in history was female. In fact, Lovelace, recognizing the future possibilities of such machines, also foresaw the potential for using symbols as well as just numbers for computing, computer programming. And she named the study the science of operations. So she was also really the inventor of computer science. As those writers for MIT acknowledge, the vision of both Babbage and Lovelace was groundbreaking. Their designs introduced many ideas today considered as features that distinguished computational thinking from other kinds of thinking. So in the, in the book Coders, Coders, The Making of a New Tribe and the Remaking of the World by Clive Thompson, it introduces us to several historic figures in the computer world who also happened to be female. His very first chapter, the software update that changed reality, focuses on the story of Ruchi Sangvi, who was 23 years old in way, way back in 2006, when she first went to work as a programmer for what was then a tiny Silicon Valley startup called Facebook, the company's first female software engineer. Most believe the budding social media company was just going to be another fad, but thanks to Sang V's work on a new feature known as Newsfeed, basically she wrote the code for it, that would fundamentally alter how people pay attention 
to each other on the platform, making it easier for them to see what their friends are up to, Facebook has become one of the most successful businesses ever. Although Newsfeed was initially hated by its users because of privacy issues that they needed to swiftly correct, Thompson says, you could argue that Newsfeed eventually became one of the most consequential pieces of computer code written in the last 20 years. It's in everything now. These algorithms. It's also the software that gave Facebook its staying power by, for better or for worse, enabling the company to use an algorithm to push what users want to see, which has resulted in billions of advertising dollars for Facebook. After five years, Sang V left Facebook to start her own company, which she soon sold to the online file hosting service Dropbox. She then started South Park Commons in San Francisco, which she describes as like a salon where a small cluster of engineers, researchers, and entrepreneurs can gather to discuss and contemplate new coding ventures. Six startups that have come out of the Commons were founded by women, Thompson says. That's an achievement. Getting more women into critical founder roles means they can deeply influence the trajectory of their firm and benefit from its success. Keep in mind, Coders is not a book about female programmers, but about coding itself. But it turns out that if you're going to talk about the history of computer programmers, you're going to need to talk a whole lot about women to get it right. Thus, his second chapter begins with three words. Mary Allen Wilkes. She had always had an incredibly analytical political mind and initially wanted to be an attorney. In 1951, before computers, computer programming, or computational think thinking were even mainstream, Wilkes junior high school geography teacher suggested, Mary Allen, when you grow up, you should be a computer programmer. And the thought stuck with her, although it wasn't until after graduating from college with a philosophy degree in 1959 that she realized how difficult it was going to be for a female at that time to pursue a legal career as a trial attorney. It just wasn't done. By then, however, there was a more public awareness about computers, the emergence of computers. Remembering her teacher's advice after graduating, she went straight to MIT, and I mean that literally. She got her diploma and had her parents drive her to MIT, where she knew there had to be computers, and asked if they had any jobs for computer programmers. They did, and they hired her on the spot with no programming experience at all. Why? Because in 1959, nobody had any programming experience. <laughs> the first computer science department wouldn't exist for another four years, and that was at Purdue University, followed by one at Stanford in 1965. At the time, programmers were just developing the binary language used to instruct computers, and it turned out that Wilkes' education in philosophy, especially Aristotelian logic, gave her an edge on the kind of symbolic thinking necessary to become a whiz at writing programs. She was great at it. So she worked on MIT's gigantic IBM 704 that could only handle about 4,000 words of code in its memory. Thompson says, writing a program was like writing a haiku or a sonnet. A good programmer was concise, elegant, and never wasted a word. They were poets of bits. Wilkes, who loved the precision thinking necessary for coding, once said, I still have a very picky, precise mind to a fault. I notice pictures that are crooked on the wall. I think there's a certain mind, kind of mind, that works that way. Who possessed minds like that, Thompson asked. Back in the 1960s, it was frequently women. It's often a surprise to people today, but at MIT's Lincoln Labs in the 1960s, when Wilkes worked there, most of the career programmers were female. 
Indeed, it was often assumed back then that women were naturals at programming. This was so because programmers were known to have been almost exclusively women during World War II, as were those at Bletchley Park in the UK and the Aberdeen Proving Grounds in the US, human computers calculating ballistic trajectories. As for Wilkes, she went on to become the author of Lynx, the Lynx operating system for the first personal computer which helped usher us into the modern computer age. And at age 30, after having accomplished all that, she was accepted into Harvard and went on to become a trial attorney, <laughs> as well as a, law, a Harvard law professor for the next 40 years. Very impressive. Another extraordinary woman, a US Navy Rear Admiral and Harvard computer scientist, Grace Hopper, some of you may have heard her name, born in 1906, was the first person to create a computer compiler. That's a program that translates regular words into computer code. This was necessary for non-technical business people after the war had ended and computers began shifting into the mainstream or into mainstream use. She was also a creator of the Flowmatic and the COBOL computer languages, the latter of which is still used today. Like some of the others I've mentioned, Hopper wasn't just a human calculator, but an important historical figure in shaping the direction, the direction of computer programming and technology. Adele Goldberg, born in Cleveland in 1945, is another genius computer scientist who was the first to design object-oriented programming, which I won't attempt to explain here. But the Smalltalk 80 programming language that she and her team developed in the 1970s is still in use and became the basis for today's most popular programming languages, including JavaScript, C++, C Sharp, and Python. And if you don't know what I just said, just know that Goldberg's contributions to modern computing has been tremendous. One might think, given this incredible history of women in computing that we would associate computing with women. Just as we have historically thought about other fields that came to be dominated initially by women like nursing and teaching. But today the opposite is true. As Thompson puts it, these days the stereotype of a coder is what you would see on a show like Silicon Valley or Mr. Robot. Young men in hooded in the US, mostly white, though some Indian and Asian programmers mixed in, all pretty nerdy, some of them with vaguely anti-establishment points of view, others out to make a quick million. So what happened? Is this switch part of some male conspiracy to co-opt an increasingly lucrative technical field once dominated by women, pushing the latter out? Maybe to some agree that's so, but more likely we're looking at revenge of the nerds scenario. As we have seen, computer programming was heavily dominated by an influence by women until fairly recently. And the change which began in the 1970s corresponds with, guess what, the widespread use and adoption of the PC, of the personal computer. Once computers were no longer the exclusive property of the military, and then universities and then corporations, ordinary people, especially inquisitive young men who like to play games on them, many of them still children, <coughs> were able to look at and learn computer code for themselves. They had access to this powerful technology. About this same time, the number of computer science departments in universities began exploding going from just one in 1962 to 120 by 1980 to being in just about every university in existence today. A new wave of often antisocial young men who looked to themselves as renegades whose purpose it was to wrest this powerful, magical technology from the establishment entered the field in university. They saw themselves as modern-day Robin Hoods robbing from the rich to give to the poor. 
Thompson says, they were also the first generation that began to push women out of the field. Unlike Wilkes' earlier cohort, the core scene of hackers in this new MIT lab were exclusively men, often stilted in conversation and lived in bachelor mode, as they put it, with no interest in dealing with anyone except those like themselves. They saw themselves as a priestly class devoted to their craft above all else. Hacking, Levi observed, had replaced sex in their lives. Greenblatt was so famously unshowered and messy that the YMCA kicked him out of its residence. While male hackers sleeping in the lab at night, the environment tended towards that of an all-guy dorm. Although this too is an overused stereotype, the world of coding became owned by these rather awkward young college students who referred preferred to hang out in their dorms and frat houses, hacking computer code with their programmers. And after the financial collapse of 2008, rather than heading to Wall Street, many, many of them began heading to Silicon Valley to establish startups. Today, Thompson says, feminism and diversity are indeed sore points in the industry. When it comes to the participation rates for women in the US, software is the rare prestigious high income industry that has actually regressed. In 1983, women were 37.1% of the computer science majors, but by the 2010s, the rate had declined to less than half of that, about 17%. On the real world job market, the numbers are the same. In 2015, a tally found that the percentage of women in technical jobs in high profile places like Google and Microsoft ranges from perhaps the high teens to around 20%. Today, many women in tech consider themselves part of what has been termed the pink collar ghetto, where they don't get the same esteem or the pay as their male counterparts do. But with the increasing need for programmers as computers, ad computers advance uh, toward exponential growth, there is plenty of work for everybody and many women are again entering into this booming field. Today women make up about 47 percent of the American workforce but only about 30 percent of the workforce at Amazon, Apple, Facebook, Google, and Microsoft, the big five tech companies. And this discrepancy is so despite the fact, as Thompson points out, that in other countries where it's considered normal for women to code, and they aren't discouraged from doing it, women do indeed flock to the field. In India, over 40% of undergraduate computer science students are women, while in Malaysia, the figure is over 50%. That's about three times the rate as here in the US. Yet on a brighter note, women's earnings in the US tech industry are now outpacing those of men's when it comes to high-skilled jobs. So let's hope that trend continues and the start, is the start of something new. But my point today is not to produce sour grapes or cry over spilled milk, but to remind ourselves of a history many of us have forgotten or never knew about. A history in which female brainiacs dominated and helped usher in a new and transformative era of human existence. It's also to remind us all of the truth that should no longer need to be stated, that the sexes may be different in some important ways, or else none of us would be here. But no matter our gender, we are all human beings and can do almost anything we wish, no matter our chromosomal makeup or the shape of our gonads. We are male and female versions of the same animal. But mostly I wanted to discuss pink collar hackers to celebrate the extraordinary contributions of these what are becoming hidden figures. Contributions of thousands of brilliant women during the past century who made our nation safer and a modern life better for all of us in significant ways. And as the father of a wonderful young woman whom I'm extremely proud of, I want to inspire everyone, but especially the women and the girls among us, by reminding you that you are as brilliant 
and as capable as anyone of accomplishing your dreams and doing great things for humanity. And I can hardly wait to see what great things you're going to do next. Thank you. Please rise as you're willing and able and join with us in singing Blue Boat Home. That's number 1064 in the blue hymnal if you want to look there. Benediction today is an excerpt from the poetry collection, Susie Bittner Was Afraid of the Drain, 
by Barbara Vance. If you always try your best, then you'll never have to wonder about what you could have done if you had summoned all of your thunder. And if your best was not as good as you hoped it would be, you still could say, I gave today all that I had in me. Amen. Blessed be. Salam alaikum and shalom.